previously on Mustang Prints or Reports. Greetings, my fair victims. It is I, the Coven Welder, your beloved dictator. Ever since late 2019, I've been sending my bats to bend you all to my will. However, among all the fools who have been resisting my virus, there's a certain someone who's been a real thorn in my side, and I'm sure a real annoyance to you. And that someone is the Mustang boy named Joshua Oro. Now you may think he seems like an innocent person, but here's where you're wrong. He's defiant, he's stubborn, he's stupid, he's rebellious, he's an autistic loser, and he's so optimistic. Over the many years, he'd been filling yours and your children's heads with thoughts of happiness and false hope. And he's under the grand delusion that Disney would ever hire him. I mean, please, as if they would ever hire him. Also, he's the grandson of a man who served under Mussolini during both world wars, which makes him the grandson of a traitor. But that's not all. Joshua is not even a real human. He's a human-horse hybrid who has no right to be one of us. And another thing, sooner or later, Joshua will fall to darkness and do the bidding of the evil witch who cursed him when he was a baby. That is why I come to you, my friends. I want every one of you to go out there, find Joshua, and kill him. If you do so, me and my bats will let you live. <laughs> so, go get your whips, guns, syringes, and brands, and destroy the Mustang Prince now! <laughs> Rest assured, sir, the authorities, along with regional center and vocational visions, will be doing everything they can to protect you from the COVID welders mob. And so far, according to my data, about 693 million people have fallen to his influence, while about 6 million have been killed by his bats, unfortunately. Still, I just can't believe he would actually get away with saying all that stuff about me and using my family history and my darn past just to make me look bad and ruin my reputation. Luckily, my data also says that over 665 million people are resisting and they refuse to believe him. And about 24,000 of them are your subscribers and three of them are your patrons. Well, that's some good news, I guess. But computer, does your data have any answers on how I can put an end to all this? Well, I understand that you burned his feet with your keyblade last year, and I don't think you should use the Infinity Gauntlet again, since that might kill you like what happened to Mr. Stark this year. So, I have an idea. If you can block about nine superhero-related movies by 9-11, that may weaken the COVID welder's power, which might give you the proper moment to use your horn to defeat him. Okay, that sounds like a good plan. And I think I know just the superhero you should start with. Your favorite, Spider-Man. But which one? I can't block the second Spider-Verse film since I didn't see it yet, and it doesn't come to physical home media until early September. Well, have you ever thought of blogging Spidey's latest MCU film? Hmm. You know, now that you mention it... I guess I had to get to this sooner or later. So... Cue the logo.
Hey everybody, I'm Joshua Oro, the Mustang Prince, and welcome to Mustang Prince Oro Reports. Well everybody, for those of you who are not under the COVID Welder's influence, today we're going to return to the MCU to talk about Spider-Man again. Now so far, I've already talked about Spidey's roles in five previous films, like his time in Team Iron Man in Captain America Civil War, to his first solo MCU film in Spider-Man Homecoming, to his time joining the Avengers in trying to stop the Mad Titan Thanos from wiping out half the universe and sadly getting disintegrated by the snap, which really broke my heart five years ago, to the time when he and many snapped victims were brought back by Bruce Banner's blip, to the time when he went on an overseas vacation with his class, while also fighting some elemental villains, which were all illusions created by Mysterio. And believe me, this film was coincidentally released during the same year when I went on my own overseas vacation with my family. Also, I want to remind everybody that Web Slingers at Disney California Adventure has got to be one of my favorite rides these days. However, after returning to New York after Mysterio's defeat, Spidey and all of New York saw footage of the London incident in which Mysterio framed Spider-Man for the drone attack and his death before exposing his secret identity as Peter Parker to the world. But, what are my thoughts on Peter Parker's latest film in the MCU? Well, we're about to find out. Released on December 17th, 2021, the movie is Spider-Man No Way Home. Now let's get started. With Spider-Man's identity now revealed, no thanks to Mysterio, our friendly neighborhood web-slinger is unmasked and no longer able to separate his normal life as Peter Parker from the high stakes of being a superhero. Desperate, Peter visits Doctor Strange and asks him to cast a spell to make the world forget that he is Spider-Man. Unfortunately, the spell goes horribly wrong and shatters the multiverse, which causes the stakes to become even more dangerous and forcing him to go up against five deadly villains, all while discovering what it truly means to be Spider-Man. Now, what are my thoughts? Well, while Endgame was the best superhero film of 2019, I say that No Way Home has got to be the best superhero film of 2021. And to further explain why I love this movie, let's move on to Mustang Notes. The film was directed by John Watts, who also directed the previous two MCU Spider-Man films. And it was written by Chris McKenna and Eric Sommers, who both not only wrote these three films, but also the Lego Batman movie, Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle, and Ant-Man and the Wasp. A third MCU Spider-Man film was planned during the production of Homecoming in 2017. Negotiations between Sony and Marvel Studios to alter their deal, in which they produced Spider-Man films together, ended with Marvel Studios leaving the project in August 2019 while I was away in Europe. But thankfully, a negative fan reaction led to a new deal between the companies a month later. Filling took place from October 14, 2020 to March 26, 2021 in New York City along with the Astoria, Sunnyside, and Long Island City neighborhoods in Queens as well as Greenwich Village in Manhattan and at Trillet Studios, Frederick Douglass High School and Midtown High School in Atlanta, Georgia. Now, when I saw this movie in theaters with my parents and sister, not only did the movie feel epic, but the beginning was very, very serious and thought-provoking due to how the public was treating Spider-Man after learning of his identity. For example, some folks label him as a murderer and a menace, while several others see him as a hero. And of course, J. Jonah Jameson of the Daily Bugle see him as public enemy number one. 
which leads to intense controversy. Plus, Peter, along with his aunt and his close friends, get interrogated by the United States Department of Damage Control. And believe me, if the public ever treated me like that, or accused me of being a Spider-Man fan, then I'd be really, really scared to show my face to anybody. But anyway, like with Homecoming, I like that this movie mostly takes place in New York City, and I think the cinematography is absolutely excellent, courtesy of cinematographer Mauro Fiore. Also, like in the Hawkeye miniseries, I noticed that Rogers the Musical was advertised in this movie a couple years before it was brought to DCA. Plus, I like the scenes in Doctor Strange's Sanctum Sectorium, which to me is very mysterious and ancient, especially in the Undercroft room. However, the mirror dimension scenes still make me feel a bit dizzy and they still give me Inception flashbacks. And I also like the scenes in Happy Hogan's Condominium. Plus, I think the action and fight scenes, like most Marvel movies, are absolutely thrilling and badass, especially during the final battle at the Statue of Liberty. Also, there are a few moments where the film can be humorous and depressing at times. However, the best part about this movie is that unlike the Avengers films, which were crossovers with heroes from the MCU, this film is a crossover between the MCU and the Spider-Man movies directed by Sam Raimi and Mark Webb, one of which I've already blogged years ago. And to me, this story concept brought back a lot of fond memories from those five movies, even if a couple of them nowadays aren't as good as I thought they were when I first saw them. Also, I must mention that the only other person whom I know who reviewed this movie before me was Bonnie Joy O'Connor back in March of last year. And after seeing her review, I think she did a great job describing this movie as she saw it. Anyway, I think I've said all I can for Mustang Notes, so Let's move on to the cast. Our hero, Peter Parker, aka Spider-Man, is played by Tom Holland, whom was in The Impossible, Pixar's Onward, Blue Skies, Spies in Disguise, and Uncharted. During this movie, with Peter's identity exposed to the public, it causes his superhero responsibilities to go into conflict with his normal life and puts those he cares about the most at risk. After being interrogated by the United States Department of Damage Control, Peter is eventually cleared of all charges with Matt Murdock's help. But the resulting controversy still upends his and his friends' futures, which leads Peter to enlist Doctor Strange to cast a memory-altering spell, wishing to make the identity of Spider-Man a secret once again. To me, Peter is more pessimistic in contrast to previous MCU films. Plus, during his encounter with the villains from different universes, Peter was not only shocked that the multiverse truly exists, but he also realized that Mysterio was unknowingly telling him the truth. Also, one of my favorite scenes is when Peter uses his math skills during the scene where he traps Doctor Strange in the mirror dimension. And I also like that Peter hopes to cure the five villains before sending them back to where they came from. Next is Doctor Stephen Strange, played by Benedict Cumberbatch, best known from Peter Jackson's Hobbit trilogy, Andy Serkis's Mowgli Legend of the Jungle, DreamWorks Penguins in Madagascar, and of course, Illumination's The Grinch. To me, Strange's role in this movie is a lot more like a colleague instead of a mentor like Iron Man was. Plus, co-writer Chris McKenna describes Strange as the voice of reason in this film. During this movie, Strange offers his aid to Spider-Man by casting a spell called the Runes of Kotkol to make the world forget his real identity. 
However, due to Peter's interference, the spell goes wrong and inadvertently unleashes villains from across the multiverse. Capturing these enemies, Strange try to use the Machina di Cadavis to send them back to their universes to meet their inevitable fates, which in my eyes kind of goes against his nature as a doctor, although his intentions were to preserve the safety of the multiverse. Also, I kind of get the feeling that Strange's role in this movie seems like a little foreshadowing for his role in his second solo film, The Multiverse of Madness. Next up is Aunt May, played by Marissa Tomai, whom I only remember from Wild Hogs and the Wild Thornberries movie. In my eyes, May is a very kind, devoted, selfless, and empathetic person, and I like that she helps her community by working with the Salvation Army and FEAST, which is short for food, emergency aid, shelter, and training. Plus, I like that she convinces Peter to help cure the multiversal villains of their ailments after meeting Dr. Osborne and realizing that he isn't really a bad person on the inside. Unfortunately, I felt really bad when May got mortally wounded by the Goblin Glider and died. Next we come to Peter's girlfriend, Michelle Jones Watson, and his best friend Ned Leeds, played by Zendaya and Jacob Batalon. To me, like in the previous two Spider-Man films, I think they're both great supporting characters while helping Peter track down and capture the rogue visitors. And I like the scene where they met two alternate versions of Spider-Man, courtesy of Ned using Doctor Strange's sling ring. Plus, I thought the part where they comfort Peter after the death of Aunt May was a very touching moment. Because, as Baymax said, those who suffer a loss require support from friends and loved ones. However, I did feel a bit sad when Ned and MJ had to tragically forget their entire history with Peter. And now we come to the multiversal Spider-Man villains, which consist of Dr. Norman Osborn, AKA the Green Goblin, played by Willem Dafoe, Dr. Otto Octavius, AKA Dr. Octopus, played by Alfred Molina, Flint Marco, AKA Sandman, played by Thomas Hayden Church, Dr. Kurt Connors, a.k.a. Lizard, played by Rice Ethans, and Max Dillon, a.k.a. Electro, played by Jamie Foxx. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with these rogues or have not seen any of the five Spider-Man films, then please let me tell you a little bit about each one. Norman Osborn was the CEO of Oscorp, which specialized in military research and he experimented on himself with an incomplete enhancement serum, causing him to develop an alternate identity, the Green Goblin. With Green Goblin in control, Norman fought Spider-Man, resulting in his demise by getting impaled by his glider. Dr. Otto Octavius was a nuclear scientist who worked towards researching and building a sustainable fusion power reactor and he developed a set of artificial intelligent mechanical arms and a neural inhibitor chip to prevent the advanced AI of the arms from influencing his mind. Unfortunately, during his demonstration, the tentacles fused with his spinal column in a lab accident and the neural inhibitor chip got destroyed, which resulted in the tentacles AI to corrupt his brain. During his time as Doc Ock, he clashed with Spider-Man until he drowned in the river with his reactor. Flint Marco was a convinced criminal who had a daughter named Penny, and after falling into a super collider, his body was molecularly altered and was given the ability to transform his body and control the sand. With these powers, Marco became known as Sandman and clashed with Spider-Man. But later, after discovering his true identity as Peter Parker, Sandman and Spider-Man made amends and ended up on good terms. Kurt Connors 
was a brilliant scientist at Oscorp with a missing right arm. After experimenting on himself with a serum he developed, Connors was transformed into a mutant lizard. While in lizard form, he believed that he had achieved in the next stage of human evolution, and he attempted to release his serum throughout New York City in order to transform everybody into humanoid lizards. However, he was stopped, defeated, and ultimately cured by Spider-Man, who put an end to his plans. And finally, Max Dillon was an electrical engineer working at Oscorp who lived a very lonely, unfulfilling life. One day at work, Max fell into a tank of genetically engineered electric eels who repeatedly bit him. The attack transformed him into a blue being made from electricity, while also repairing his gap teeth, balding hairline, and impaired vision. Seeing this as his chance to be somebody, he took the name Electro and became an enemy of Spider-Man, whom he used to worship, and whose name he figured out. In their final battle at Oscorp's main power grid, Spider-Man overcharged Electro with energy, causing him to explode. Now, in my eyes, seeing all these villains was the coolest and most nostalgic part of the whole movie. And I found it interesting that a few of them have connections to each other, like how Osborne and Octavius know each other due to them being friends, and how Connors and Max know each other due to them being co-workers at Oscorp. Plus, I like how some of them mention their backstories and how they met their demise while fighting Spider-Man. However, nowadays, I feel sympathy for them due to the fact that they still have humanity in them before they became villains. And I like that Peter wants to help cure them before sending them back to their universes in hopes that they can get a second chance. Also, out of all five of these villains, I think Norman, Otto, and Max stick out the most to me. You see, while not being controlled by the Goblin, Norman is in a disoriented and fragile state, and he feels guilt and remorse for his actions. And I like that Norman helps Peter cure Doc Ock. Also, I think Willem Dafoe has not lost his scary touch while acting as the Goblin. Doc Ock was the first multiversal villain to meet Peter, and while he was very hostile, I found it funny when he lost control of his tentacles due to them integrating Stark nanotech from Peter's iron spider suit. Also, after getting cured, thanks to Peter and Norman creating a new inhibitor chip, I like that Otto offered his assistance. And I like the part where he defended Doctor Strange from Green Goblin's razor bats. Plus, unlike in Spider-Man 2, where his tentacles were mechanical puppets, the tentacles in this film are CG. As for Max, well, as I said during my blog of The Amazing Spider-Man 2 back in 2014, I felt that he was a very sympathetic person due to him feeling like a nobody in society. And during this movie, I like that his human form is restored from his blue form, and I like that he was cured by Doc Ock. Plus, I found it pretty funny that he thought the Spider-Man that he knew was black. Speaking of which, nowadays, I kind of wonder what would happen if Miles Morales would ever be brought into the MCU in the future. Finally, we come to the previous two Spider-Men, played by Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield. Like the villains, these two Spider-Men were brought into the MCU due to Doctor Strange's corrupted spell, and they got to meet Peter and his friends after the tragic death of Aunt May. To me, I think they make great supporting characters for Peter, like when they share their own loss experiences, like what happened to their Uncle Ben, Gwen Stacy, even Harry Osborn, and their experiences as Spider-Man. Also, I like the parts where they help Peter make cures for Norman Osborn, Kurt Connors, and Max Dillon. 
and when they team up together on Liberty Island. Other actors in the film include J.K. Simmons, John Favreau, Benedict Wong, Tony Revolori, Charlie Cox, and Tom Hardy. And now on to my final words. Overall, Spider-Man No Way Home is a spectacular movie, and it truly deserves to be the best superhero film of 2021. The film was not only nostalgic, but it was also very serious, intense, and thought-provoking, while other parts were pretty funny and heartbreaking at times. The action is thrilling and badass, the science was interesting, and I liked the use of the mystic arts and the multiverse. Plus, I like how Peter learns and discovers what it truly means to be Spider-Man. Doctor Strange was okay, despite the fact that he went to the point of not caring what happens to anybody who had mental or physical issues. MJ and Ned were sweet supporting characters. Same goes for Aunt May. May she rest in peace. Also, I thought the multiversal villains were the coolest part of the whole movie, and the older Spider-Men were great characters too. So, if you folks are Spider-Man fans like I am, then I assure you that this is a movie you must watch and own. And I give this movie the highest rating of 100%. Well, that's all for now, folks. Be sure to join me next time as we look at Tony Stark's second solo movie in the MCU, Mustang Power.